Alright, uh, we might kick off. Okay. Alright, um, thanks guys. Um, sorry you're going to you're gonna hear me um, uh, again, but this time, fortunately, I'm, I'm just uh, moderating, not um, speaking. Um, so, uh, pretty much everything I was going to uh, say to, to uh, open this panel has sort of been said by um, the previous uh, panellists. Um, I'd just quickly like to begin by um, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, uh, the Ghana people, and pay my respect to their elders past and present, present uh, acknowledging this always was and always will be Aboriginal land and that sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, now, today's panel uh, follows on to a large extent from what we were just talking about in the political economy panel. Um, our topic is workers, jobs and climate change. And in particular, um, it's fantastic, I just want to give a shout out to the organisers um, when I and a few others said to them, look, we can't just, as we sort of said in the last panel, you can't just talk to the workers in the affected industries, you actually have to hear from them. Um, that's pretty critical. Um, so our three panellists today are Tony Ma, National President of the CFMEU, uh, Ella Factor, an organiser with the Community and Public Sector Union, and Peter Ong, who's the Secretary of Queensland and Northern Territory Electrical uh, Trades Union. Now, our, our format is I'm just going to ask our three panellists to um, give their opening remarks, and then we'll just go to a um, uh, moderated uh, panel discussion. Uh, Tony, after you. Yes, thanks, Lachlan. Um, thanks for having me. Um, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a union thug. Um, <laughs> The CFMU thug. Oh, I, I used to be six foot six, like the rest of them. But after nearly a couple of decades of conservative anti-union government, it does wear you down over time, and you end up like this. So, <laughs> um, long time since I've been in a lecture theatre. Um, well, I just want to talk about just transition. Um, We've been talking about it for a decade at least, I reckon, and it's still no clearer to me. Um, the, in terms of climate policies, whatever suite of climate policies democracy throws up, whether it's regulation or uh, a cap-and-trade scheme or anything else, really, um, that's going to drive industry restructuring and industry closures. And uh, basically, it's going to affect just about every industry in every country over a two- or three-decade period. So it's a pretty big challenge. Now, unions are actually probably the cl closest you've got to an expert on industry restructuring in society because we face it every day. Lobbying governments, working with cooperative employers, campaigning against uncooperative employers uh, to try and get the best deal for workers and the communi host communities they're in. So we sort of know what works and what doesn't work. We know what we'd be prepared to stand on the stump, as we say, and recommend to workers as a good deal, and we know what we wouldn't recommend as a good deal. Um, and I haven't heard too many proposals um, that amount to just transition. In fact, our union commissioned a bit of research from, I'm sorry, it was the University of New South Wales. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't Richard Holden, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> and uh, called the Ruhr or Appalachia, uh, basically doing a comparison about how different countries have handled uh, industry restructuring and labour market adjustment programs. And basically the news is that everywhere in the English-speaking world we've got nothing to learn mm. because they're as bad as us and we're atrocious. Mm. West I don't know what it is about the English-speaking world, but we seem to have this culture of sack them and forget them. Yeah. And we know what happens. There's been study after study. When places close, a third of workers get a comparable job, decent pay, what not. Uh, a third get insecure, shitty pay, shitty jobs, and a third never work again. Mm. Right? Um, how many studies do we have to do? So uh, that's not a just transition. And that's what will happen unless we have some mechanism in place. Now, the only ones, the gold standard's really set by the Nordic countries and Germany. Yeah. And of course, the famous example that I think everybody knows about is the German coal industry, which over a 30-year period to 2018, phased out all of their black coal mine, and over a 20-year period to 2038, will phase out all their brown coal mines, which are actually efficient. Um, and in both cases, they do so without any forced retrenchments. They provide finance for bridging finance so people can access pensions earlier, and they inject money into the, into the regional economies, because all these industries cluster. Mm. 
uh, to, to make sure that there's not intergenerational unemployment, that there are new jobs to go to in the regions in which people live. So, I mean, that's a successful model of just transition. So if a Green New Deal doesn't give us that outcome, then I'm afraid it's just marketing spin, mm -hmm. in my opinion. A jobs guarantee, which I heard about for the first time yesterday, that sounds like a great addition to the social safety net. And I, I agree with what Lachlan said, that it, that's, a, that's a really good idea. But it doesn't give you a just transition, because it's based on the minimum wage mm -hmm. and... <laughs> uh, and look, thanks everyone for um, apologies, and look, thanks for everyone for remaining calm and everything. Sorry, uh, as you were, as you were saying, Tony, <laughs> we should have actually all. important as opposed to some bullshit <laughs> fucking ranting. Uh, we should have brought the, the uh, wrong panel to mate. interrupt. <laughs> uh, look, um, so <laughs> the cupboard's pretty bare when you look at ex successful examples of just transition. So um, we tried to get something going when Hazelwood closed. Hazelwood closed with just four months' notice. The French multinational did a shocking thing just giving us four months' notice mm. over the Christmas break as well. That's great. Um, and so I went to see Josh Frydenberg and said, well, here's what they did in Germany. How about that in Australia? And he said, they don't get involved in labour markets. That's, uh, <laughs> so if anyone's waiting for, waiting for Josh to f fly the flag for a, uh, climate policy or uh, workers, uh, they're seriously mistaken. So I went and saw... Daniel Andrews and Tim Pallas in Victoria, and they committed to this, we, you know, we made it up on the run, a worker transfer scheme, uh, which was, um, because we didn't have any time, it was, uh, it was uh, voluntary for companies to participate. And uh, so they did, they did actually um, conduct expressions of interest in the, in the remaining power stations and mines, and we got 400 expressions of interest. Right? We only had to replace about 450, 500 people. Um, and the, but the companies would only let 90 go. Can you b believe it? We only placed 90 people. And this is a situation where the government was prepared to pay 50% of the redundancy benefit. Um, a benefit that was owed by the companies to the workers. The government was going to subsidise it to tune of 50%, and they still only let 90 go. So I've taken the view that in the coal-fired electricity sector, you've got to have a statutory authority. You've got to have an element of compulsion. Mm. Now, the, the, the better companies will do the right thing. The next power station to close is the Liddell Power Station in the Hunter Valley, and AGL has given the unions, all of our unions, a commitment um, to no forced redundancies. And they will um, redeploy those workers in a couple of years' time to the neighbouring Bayswater Power Station, which has got a little bit more life left. Um, and so, uh, that way, Oh, and, and, there'll, and there'll be some jobs for the workers, uh, some of the workers on the Liddell site because there's going to be uh, battery farms and solar farms and a gas plant. So um, that's a good thing to do. So what we want is a statutory authority that basically compels everybody in the electricity sector to do what AGL is voluntarily doing. Uh, in other words, legislate best practice. And, you know, that's not a bad public policy position. Now, the reason... Uh, the reason we're saying do it for that sector is that there's no argument that it's already in structural decline. Uh, eight power stations have closed in the last decade. The remaining 21, the owners of them have said, have told the stock market, um, they're going to close and not be replaced by similar plants. So there's no argument. And the, the reason why you do it on a sector basis is simply this, that if you want to set a new standard, if you want to set a new standard, what we've done for over 100 years in the union movement is establish a beachhead. Mm. Prove it works. Let people kick the tyres. Mm. And then spread it. That's what we did with annual leave, long service leave. Uh, that's what we did with superannuation. Mm. It didn't start with Paul Keating introducing economy-wide measures. It started with beachheads. Mm. So, in terms of climate policies, my take out is this. We can do it with social co cohesion or we can do it with careless indifference mm -hmm. and social chaos. Yep. And I think a proper just transition demonstrated in the sector that's going to face those issues first uh, is the way to get people to have some confidence. Because they won't believe it could happen because it happened in Germany. That's too mm -hmm. far away. Mm -hmm. And they have a different political system. We have to prove that it can work in a, in a place like Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so 
that, that's our view about that. And the, the other thing I'd say, the other take out is this, that um, climate activists are very fond of saying we've got to, got to have big ambition, we've got to be ambitious for the targets, ambitious for this and ambi ambitious for that. We've got to be ambitious about labour standards too. Here, here. Okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Ella. Thanks, um, thanks, Lachlan. And thanks, Tony. Um, uh, I just want to say I'm here representing the community and public sector. So we are the union that represents the public servants in the federal government, as well as the ACT and Northern Territory governments. Um, and before I keep going, I do want to acknowledge the, uh, the land, the, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. Pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging, with particular respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of the public sector union. Uh, you know, a lot of I, I did want to talk first about the role of unions in general, but I think um, Tony's just covered quite a bit of that. Is that you know, unions are the industrial relations experts, the institutions of this country that have been working in the labour market all of this time. And we do need to make sure that any planning that goes on around uh, changing the industrial relations landscape, changing the labour market settings, anything like that, needs to be consulting with the, the subject matter experts of that area, which is the unions. And then I'd say on top of that, if I'm looking at, looking at any industry planning or want to know anything about any particular industry, my first go-to is always that the relevant union. When I wanted to know more about the building standards problems going on in the legislation for that, I went straight to the CFMEU mm. to ask for the detail because they are the subject matter experts because they're yep. members. The union is the members in the workplace. I think yep. that's something we all really need to recognise, that the union is not just the elected officials that is often spoken about in the media, that's described as being factional warlords or this or that. The union is the workers in their workplaces and therefore they are the subject matter experts in yep. their industries. And all of this planning that we're talking about for this entire week and therefore needs to be consulting with unions. Um, so, on to the public sector union. As so much of what is being talked about this weekend does make assumptions about the role of the public sector. So, community and public sector union does have some opinions on a lot of these spaces. Uh, but, you know, not just the, those of us that work for the union, but our members. We're, our members are the public servants that are implementing these policies. They do know a lot about what's going on. Um, and therefore, it's imperative that they are consulted. Our members are consulted. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say that CPSU is really keen to work collaboratively. We want to work collaboratively with the other unions, with the policy developers, with the communities and the workers that are affected so that we can support a true just transition in the way that Tony is describing. Um, so, look, you know, amongst those experts that we represent are the CSIRO, the climate scientists are our members, the workers at the Bureau of Meteorology are our members. Uh, we have members that are the researchers, the engineers, the software developers, the experts that help the community manage in the face of a changing climate. Uh, you know, the workers in DHS, in Centrelink, out on the front line helping administer the relief payments. That is our members. And they therefore know what's going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of knowledge about what the impacts are on the ground and how we can actually help support communities in the face of this change. Um, and then on to the role of the public sector in general. The government uh, does need to take a lead role. I think, you know, taking an MMT lens, which we're open to in this union, we, you know, we, we recognise that the federal government is the one that issues currency. It's not the state governments, it's not the local governments. We need to work with every level of government, but we do need to recognise that the federal government needs to take the lead, at least in the financing, in terms of being able to afford afford to utilise the resources and move the resources in this country in the way that we need to for this rapid transition into a low fossil fuel economy for the future. Um, so CPSU uh, has a position that just transitions authorities need to be established. Now this we lobbied for within, now I, I should just also say I, I have held another hat over the years that is I was on the National Executive of LEAN, the Labour Environment Action Network and so worked very uh, strongly within the Labor Party to help develop the policies 
uh, including the commitment to just transition authority. Now, these need to be established in the local communities. They need to be uh, administered by the federal government, but they need to be local, and the, the work that comes from that and the collaboration and consultation needs to be with the regions that are around the challenge so that they can, as Lachlan said in the earlier panel, self-emancipate from the crisis. Uh, then, and then the other key component that CPSU has been lobbying for is looking at the employment services and the crisis that the privatisation of employment services has created. They, we, we believe that it should be renationalised, it should be brought back into the public service. There's... <laughs> And I, I wanted to expand a little bit on that in that the, the privatisation of, of employment services has actually contributed to the hollowing out of the government. And we're looking at the regions and we're seeing the hollowing out of employment there and part of that has been the hollowing out of the government. They have lost jobs in the private sector, yes, they've also lost jobs in the public sector. This federal government has massively slashed the amount of public servants there are, and a lot of that has been from the regions. Look at Townsville. They have lost hundreds of public servants. They used to have local Centrelink officers that, when they had disasters, would go out and do outreach to the communities that needed support. Now they're expected to get online and use these online services because of the slashing of funding. So, the, and what that's done to the capacity of the public service to be able to have the expertise to support our country's transition and make sure it's just and inclusive has been terrible because there used to be frontline staff that were working with the unemployed to know what they needed. There used to be frontline staff understanding working with the unemployed to know what upskilling, what retraining and this sort of thing. Now that all of that has been privatised, we have been losing that corporate knowledge from our federal public service and instead developing expertise in contract management. But it's the public service servants that have to write those contracts and if they haven't got the on-the-ground experience because we have outsourced that the frontline section of it, then the contracts keep getting worse and worse written because you know we're losing that and hollowing out the capacity. Um, and then just a really quick last point, and I know this has been said repeatedly, but we must not base this on shaming any existing communities. We have to be inclusive. We have to recognise that workers, you know, that under neoliberalism we have commodified everything. You can't survive without money anymore. You can't get water, you can't get food, you can't get housing. And as the climate heats, you can't get air conditioning, electricity, the, the energy price is going berserk. So we must not shame people for wanting decent jobs to be able to support their families and their communities. We must work with them and respect the work they do. And they absolutely are correct. When I went out in Townsville door knocking before the election, and they told me they are proud of the fact that they have kept this country's lights on. We have to respect that, and we have to respect that we are using the lights that they have been keeping on. Not shame them for working in a fossil fuel industry, but respect them and support their need for a just transition. Thank you. Righto, uh, comrades, thanks for having me. Um, not generally my usual audience, I've got to say. I left school at 14 and a half. Um, the sum total of my university attendance has been the last two days. <laughs> And uh, as for <coughs> economics, well, I've learnt a lot in the last two days, put it that way. I'm, I'm not an academic. Um, just transition is, is, as Tony said, and I agree with, it's something that's happened over, you know, a, a lot of years and it hasn't been done very well. Um, and I think it's been highlighted now because of the climate emergency that we have um, and that we have to work towards transitioning out of the fossil fuel energy into a renewable fuel energy market or energy system um, and a just transition how do we look at that well to me it seems fairly simple and that is you've got a community and uh, workers that have spent years um, delivering a product to us that we've used and everyone's spoken about that today um, and if we're going to take that away and we need to take that away because if we believe the science and I think everyone in this room does um, then we, have to, then we have to change what we're doing if we're to survive. And so to do that, we must provide economic alternatives to workers and those communities who have come to rely upon uh, the fossil fuel um, 
energy that we've provided for so many years. We have to give them um, jobs and we have to give them industry in those communities to make sure that they survive. Because I have um, many members that work in the coal industry, nowhere near as many as Tony does, but many in the coal industry and the mining sector and many in the power generation. And, you know, there's three generations of, of um, family members who have come up in that industry. So to just go to them and say, that's it, this is shit now, um, you can't do it anymore, is certainly not a viable option. There's a lot of proud history in those industries um, and it's something that has to be handled delicately and it has to be handled with dignity and a transition to, a, to future work for those people and future industries for those communities has to be handled properly because if it doesn't, then it pretty well ends there. We give the naysayers the ammunition that they need to stop a transition into renewable energy. It's as simple as that. Um, so how do we do it? Well, I mean, I, I don't have a magic wand, but certainly, um, you know, my union, um, sorry, I won't say my union, our union, the ETU Queensland uh, Northern Territory, which I'm the secretary of, has always been a campaigning union. Um, you know, between 2009 to 2015, I think we were continually campaigning against privatisation with the Not For Sale campaign. Um, we managed to unseat one Labor government and one LNP government. The, the Bly government started it, Labor government started uh, the attacks on um, our union and other unions within the electricity industry and the rail network. So they first started to privatise the rail network um, we, and we ended up with Horizon. So that was a pretty shit outcome for us and a bit of a failure if you look at it, but it certainly gave us the kick-off for, for our privatisation campaign, which we kept going for the next four years. Um, we turfed down a Bly out on her ass because she wouldn't listen. Um, we turfed the Labor government out on their ass because they wouldn't listen. We were the pariahs of the union movement for some time for doing that. Um, but, you know, we did that because the LM incoming LNP government, or the ones that got in, Campbell Newman, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, you know, they, 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 gave us, they gave us a so-called commitment. They wrote a letter to us saying that they would not privatise our electricity assets if they got in. We published that, that in the uh, Courier Mail, and we thought that that's what they would do. Um, as soon as they got in, they started to privatise our electricity assets. So we kept going with that campaign. And it's interesting to know, we must be pretty good at campaigning because the Campbell Newman government got in um, on a 72-seat majority and they were destined to be in for the next 10 years, um, but we turfed them out on their ass in one term um, and put a Labor government back in because they lied and they, uh, they started going for privatisation, which brings me to the point of why I mentioned that. Um, anything that we do within our... Uh, re within the renewable sector and, and a move to just transitioning, I believe has to be done within the public se sector and has to be done um, by the government. Now, federally we're in a world of pain because this government doesn't give a shit about renewables and it doesn't really give a shit about unemployment and uh, it doesn't give a shit about finding jobs or a just transition. I'm not sure what it gives a shit about. Um, big <laughs> business, um, Hawaii, I don't know. but. Um, they don't give a shit about um, a just transition and they don't give a shit about moving to the renewable industry and I honestly don't believe that they believe about the climate emergency that we're facing. So, but what we have seen, when the state government in Queensland came out and said we're going to move to 50% um, renewable energy by 2030, that's really when it came on our radar, about four years ago, um, and we started lobbying the government then about setting up a just transition authority in the state, which we've now succeeded in doing, and we've got a great, a great bloke uh, heading that up, Lance McCallum. Lance worked for our union nationally on policy and uh, renewables, and then went into the ACTU, worked with Sally for a period of time until I managed to poach him back and get him to set up the just transition authority in Queensland, and he's, he's kicked that off well and hit the ground running. They're doing some modelling around um, 
areas in central Queensland where the, you know, we're looking at where the next coal mines will have to be shut down or will be moved to shut down and what we can do to make sure we have a just transition in those areas. It's not simple but I guess you've got to come up with, um, you know, there are jobs in renewables and it's just a matter of, and this is why you need the government, it's a matter of setting up industry in those areas. It's a matter of looking at, we've had the uh, the ANU come up with 22,000 pumped hydro sites around Australia that can be looked at. Um, can we can we turn a coal mine that feeds a, a, a coal-fed power station into a pumped hydro with the infrastructure there, the transmission lines, the substations, and you turn that coal mine into a pumped hydro generator? Um, these are the things that need to be looked at. But setting up battery manufacturing in areas where have, have previously had a coal mining industry in them. Now people will say, well, you know, that's not going to be cheap or it's not going to be viable if it's a private industry doing it and they want to maximise their profits. But this is why we need government to do it and government to just cough up the money for it. Um, when they started building solar farms, as I said, the Queensland government made that initiative. It was a great initiative that 50% renewable energy by 2030. But all they did was open the floodgates for um, speculators and investors to come in and start making money around solar farms. They saw it as the next industry that they could make money out of. Now our members saw it as a chance for them in the regions to maybe get some work in their hometowns in the regions instead of being FIFO, living away from their families for four weeks on one week off. And instead every one of those solar farms was built by backpackers on $17 an hour um, because of the current legislation that we have under this Morrison government that was obviously introduced before him, but, um, you know, the building code of practice, we used to have clauses in our agreements that stipulated you couldn't use labour hire unless they paid the same wages and conditions as uh, the agreement that, that were, they were working under, right? You couldn't bring in labour hire unless they paid the same wages and conditions as your agreement. So. This government introduced a bill and code of practice that made that fundamental protection for workers illegal. It was illegal now to have those clauses in our agreements. So all that happened under these solar farms is you have speculators who, who grab uh, money, investors, uh, they're the developer, they must get their 10% margin profit return on that and then you have the constructor who needs to get his 6 to 8% um, profit return on that and as um, Professor Dusseldorf, Dusseldorf yeah. Yeah. Um, was saying, you know, the, the, the money in, in uh, renewable energy is going down. There is not massive profits in it anymore. So if the developer and the constructor is picking up 16% margin of profits already, the only way that they can make those profits is to screw down workers' wages. Mm. It's as simple as that. So all that was being created out of this new industry was insecure work on poverty line wages. So if you do that, you're seeing the workers in the regions under an ALP government who's got good ideas, they want to push for renewables, you're seeing those workers turn against an ALP government because they're not delivering jobs. And then if they turn against the government and vote in a, a, uh, an LNP government, well the LNP government doesn't want fucking renewables anyway. So. It is, it is a, a shit situation and, and then we have to, as unions, then have to go to the, the developers and the, and the constructors who are really only looking at their own profits and say, listen, if you don't start fucking fixing up these jobs and making sure that you're delivering decent wages to the workers and decent outcomes to the communities, then they're going to vote out the LP, there won't be this push for renewables and you won't have the ability to make any profits anyway. So you've got to try and dig into them that way. But it'd be a whole lot fucking easier if the government just did it because they don't have to make massive profits, right? If the government just did it. And we would then have a better ability of setting standard agreements across the construction phase of renewable energy projects. And then you have, um, you know, government owned, constructed and operated renewable energy generators around Australia. And that's the only way that we, we can really go forward on this. Cheers, Peter. I'm oh, sorry, you get. I'll finish there if you like, mate. Because I've got to catch a plane at four o'clock. Yeah. But, but look, it, it, there is definitely um, a means to do a just transition. But 
People have to bite the bullet. Governments have to bite the bullet. And we've got to get rid of this fucking Morrison government, I'll tell you straight off, yeah. because they're not going to do anything. <laughs> Thanks for your time, Tommy. Now, um, just to... Uh, Hey, just quickly, um, uh, if you need a, if you got your plane, to, if you got to catch your plane at four, just you, you know, feel, feel, feel free to nick off whatever you want. Ten past three. Ten past yeah, it's, uh, ten past three. Um, we might just quickly go to uh, do a bit of. Uh, I think can we can we go until uh, regardless of where, when um, uh, when Pete's got to leave? Do you mind if we go till three thirty? Or what, what's our what's our cut off here, Paul? Where's Gab? <laughs> oh, where's 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 Gab? Where's the the all right, we'll, 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 go, we'll, go, we'll go to 3.30 then um, if people have any I've got five minutes. minutes. Okay. All right, no worries. Do you know, just say, just oh, before sorry. we start with yep. questions, just to assure you our unwelcome interloper has now been escorted from the campus and we don't expect him um, to return. So thank you for your forbearance and apologies um, for that. Stephanie Kelton is still going to speak this afternoon. Okay. He's not going to be intimidated by such threats. So yep. I think um, please show her your, her your gratitude when she comes later. And I guess if something like that was going to happen, what better time than while we've got a Sade sipping socialist and a bunch of union slugs? Yeah, he picked the wrong, <laughs> he picked so, the wrong uh, fucking panel. Yeah, he picked way. the wrong fucking panel. I will. I'm surrounded by union fans. I'm yeah, exactly. The real crime, the real crime, was, the real crime was wearing cargo shorts to a fucking economics conference. <laughs> Um, yeah, we might, we'll, we'll, we'll go to audience. Like, I, I could have a million questions, but I'm sure you'll have some great questions. I'll start with um, Jeff Harcourt. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say how excited I was. To hear from oh, I just want to say how excited I was to hear from our union friends. The, the, the most essential thing that has to be done is to take capital to labour and not labour to capital because yeah. in that way you save generations of social capital being brought up in, in communities and uh, it's, it's just such obvious common sense but it has to be done by the government as you say. I just can't say more than hear, 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 hear. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, question for Tony Ma. Um, you mentioned uh, restructuring for domestic coal-fired power generators. Um, I'd like to focus on export thermal coal, in particular Newcastle, the world's biggest coal port, and the Hunter Valley, which has been torn to shreds. Uh, the industry there is way out of proportion to what it has been. Um, agriculture's, uh, agricultural land have been, has been taken away. Aboriginal cultural sites, the Hunter River is a mess and getting drained out. Um, the water security of those mines right now is getting right to the brink where they might start, who knows, draining off more water. So it's, it's not tenable. I'm just wondering how, which, we've got a couple of mine approvals on the table right now. We've got, there's uh, Glendale modification number four. Um, there's also the fact that Bialong Valley uh, was not approved and part of that was predicated on the fact that we, they, they counted downstream emissions. So I'd like to know your position on this downstream emissions which is hitting the um, New South Wales Parliament any week again now and has been um, uh, campaigned against by the New South Wales Minerals Council and the mines. So I'm just wondering if which, which side of the fence you're going to sit on that one. And, and a Glendale modification for how you stand on that. How many more mines are we going to approve? Open cut coal mines in the Hunter Valley. How many more catastrophic um, uh, events later is it going to be? The fires and whatnot. And what um, it seemed to be a passive approach to. Oh, we've got this. Uh, we asked um, Frydenberg, and we we kicked this idea around. When you, when is the union, you and the union, the mining division, actually going to come out and? lead the process in the Hunter Valley for a transition. Thanks. Could I just quickly uh, just add something uh, to that, um, Tony? I know there's been um, some talk about um, uh, hydrogen industry and having hydrogen-fired um, steel making and things like that and, and actually becoming um, a renewable exporter and things like that. I'd just like to tack on um, onto that. Um, where, where, where we as environmentalists should be investing to support 
um, new local mining jobs in, that are part of the renewable economy um, and where some of those job opportunities are and what we can do as environmentalists to actually support good, mine, good new mining jobs that are going to be necessary for a new renewable export um, sector. Because we tend to sort of talk about mining as the enemy. And that's, as I sort of said in the previous panel, that's, that's wrong because we need mining workers to get the, get the materials we need to build a zero carbon economy. It's not going to be done without, without essentially your members and their jobs. Yeah, uh, well on that question of um, exports, we support the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement operates um, to reduce demand for high emission products in each country. And it's all the signatories to the Paris Agreement who have responsibility for what we call Scope 3 emissions, but uh, they, every, our Scope 3 emissions are someone else's Scope 1 and 2 emissions. So the whole design of the Paris Agreement is to um, place that responsibility on the country for their domestic emissions. And, uh, and that's, what's that's what Australia is responsible for, the emissions, Scope 1 and 2 emissions produced in Australia, uh, and we support that. There's nothing in the Paris Agreement that requires any country to um, uh, reduce the export of any product. Um, and, to mis and it shouldn't be misrepresented. It is what it is. It took 30 years to negotiate. It's on life support uh, because the US is going to walk away. Um, and the more the Morrison government survives, it will contribute to its demise. So we support the continuation of that global process because there's no hope without a global process. Uh, and uh, uh, there's no doubt that that will operate over time to reduce the demand for our exports. Um, and that's when we will hopefully be able to say um, we've successfully shown how a just transition can apply in the domestic coal-fired power sector. Uh, and that can be applied to the next sector and the next sector and the next industry. Because you've got to remember that emissions don't have to just re uh, reduce in the electricity sector. That's only a third of our problem. There's 20% in transport. It's, I think, 20% in the building industry, the built environment. Um, so, I mean, there's a whole heap of uh, uh, recommendations from a uh, task force that I was on uh, back in Rudd's day about energy efficiency. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit that just isn't being picked. So, we support those processes. We're not going to join the anti-coal campaign. We're the coal miners union. Um, and I, you know, but what we will do is tell workers the truth about what they're facing, and we've always done. That. And just um, and I suppose another point just to add on to that as well is we've also got to build, we've got to build the new. As we were saying earlier, we've got to actually build the new zero carbon mining jobs as well. And this is what that um, Stephen sent me this uh, this uh, webinar about uh, beyond, beyond zero emissions and the Melbourne University Energy Transition Hub have been doing research on what are the new mining jobs and mining exports we need to be doing to actually provide the materials the rest of the world need to make their solar panels and their wind turbines as well as our own. And to a large extent, I think that, 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 that having that conversation as well and talking about how about the, the blue collar jobs we need to create in order to decarbonise um, has to be done alongside talking about the future of um, coal exports as well. Because if you just have the conversation about coal exports, you are, you're violating the Brian Coal Adjust Transitions Principle and you're pushing workers in those regions up against it. So you've got to have the conversation about green jobs and you've got to have the conversation about where they fit into our existing blue collar um, industries and employment, not just talking about sh what we're going to shut down. Um, uh, we've got another question over here. Okay. Uh, back. No, no, quite the opposite. We're saying we should be building. Oh, sorry, you thought you were looking at me. With export industries, you're always in the hands of your customers. We faced that before. We had 30% of the workforce slashed in the late 90s, um, and that could happen again. So we do have to move on to other questions. Yep. Hey, um, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the role of um, land in a, in a Green New Deal. Um, and just, I'd, I'd like to take a couple of minutes to provide some context for that, if that's okay. 
everyone's got sure. the patience for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, cool. So um, Go, we're not huh? talking about land, I'm not talking about the environment, which is what we've spoken about. I'm talking about land, which is currently held as capital. Mm. Um, so land gives us shelter, it gives us food, it gives us community, it gives us meaning, it gives us culture and a way of life. Um, so, but currently those lands are held as capital by rich people. And so what we get uh, in order to access those basic needs that we're supposed to get from land, uh, we have to do these jobs. So we're basically wage slaves. Those jobs are made scarce so that we, it increases our demand for them so that we think we want these jobs. So we talk about these things in terms of labor and capital and then the environment is an externality but we don't talk about the land and our need to have land. So we don't need jobs, we need land. And I mean there was the promise in the past when emancipating slaves of 40 acres and a mule. You might remember that. I'd like my 40 acres and a mule. I'd probably eat the mule first but yeah, um, it would basically if we had even just 20 percent of the population on this continent actually living on the land and you know um, having those things directly from the land then it wouldn't be on fire right now. Now the, the Green New Deal requires uh, a lot of rare earth metals as you know and for energy infrastructure it requires a lot of copper and there's not much of that left. There's no high grade copper ore left in the world. Now so they're scraping the bottom of the barrel for that. And of course, as you know, rare earth metals require a toxic refining process that creates radioactive waste. So China doesn't want to do it anymore because it can't do it anymore because it doesn't know how it's going to store that radioactive waste for the next couple of millennia. Um, so they're opening up those rare earth metal mines on Aboriginal land now. So I'm getting a bit emotional. Um, also, the, the massive amounts of steel you know, that's required. That's all iron ore, you know, coming out of South Australia and the Kimberley as well and all that sort of thing. So basically the Green New Deal is still going to require massive amounts of mining on Aboriginal land. Um, so I, I guess in the context of all of that, uh, what are your thoughts on the physics of um, actually making a Green Deal work in terms of land? Land as habitat for the human um, organisms that we are. We're, we're <coughs> biological organisms that need a habitat. Um, is there any room for land in there? Sure. Thanks, Tyson. Um, Ella and then Tony. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, look, thank you. That, that's, you know, I, I hear you. I'm not sure if uh, it's something I've thought through enough to be able to state a position on. Uh, I, I agree, as I mentioned earlier, that we have the capitalism basically, the system that we have uh, built has commodified everything and the structure that we live within is is part of the obstacle to change that it is, you know, we, we are wage slaves and we can't survive without participating in the system. The system is a high fossil fuel based system right now and, you know, I would I'd refer to how much of uh, people are trying to find ways to individually act because we haven't managed to change the government. And so we're, we're all feeling quite powerless and we're all using our you know, reusable water bottles and this sort of thing. But it is the system that is the problem. We do need system level change and we need to work together to achieve that. And that can only be done through collective action. Um, I'll, I'll take this moment to jump just really quickly to you know this idea of the fracturing of the left that came up yesterday, and that we really do need to work together. We can't achieve this level of rapid transformation in a fair and inclusive manner if we fracture ourselves. So everybody that believes that we need to achieve this needs to learn compromise, collaborative listening, empathy, it's the only way that collective action can possibly work. Purism will not get us anywhere. Purism has not gotten us anywhere so far. You know, Goff had a great line about the impotent being pure. 
Um, we need to work together, and that means working co uh, collectively with the other unions. My most proud uh, campaigns that I've worked with over the past years have been, um, for example, the public renewables campaign that Peter was talking about in the ATU. That was a, a partnership between Labor Party members, rank and file activists in the Labor Party under the Labor Environment Action Network banner. Uh, we've got a great T-shirt up here, that bright green one. Go lean. Um, and, and ETU, so union members in their workplaces coming together to go and lobby the government to build a public renewables future for Queensland. And, you know, that is now happening and being put into place with the, the Australia's first government-owned corporation, the Clean Energy Co. Uh, Co, to be building those public renewables. So that's the way forward is to not fracture, not splinter further, but join the movement, even if it doesn't agree with you completely. I mean, I wouldn't need to be a Labor Party activist if Labor Party already had perfect policies. There wouldn't be any work for me to be doing. I've been in there, in that tent, to work with the other Labor Party members and the unions, and we've worked together with the CFMEU and Tony as well to improve Labor Party's policies in the space. So just an example of how collaboration rather than uh, atomizing and fracturing further is how we need to go. I should just um, add on that as well. <laughs> I should just add on that, just um, two point, um, to, to Tyson's point about, um, I think the Green New Deal should be an opportunity to um, start. Well, while we, we need to have a sort of a singular purpose and a singular vision for what we should do. We can also use this as an opportunity, just as um, uh, Peter was saying, this is an opportunity to talk about public ownership of renewables. Do I use the, the phrase public ownership of the means of production? Um, just as, though, as, as that's an opportunity. Um, and there's an, there was a question earlier about, I think, about mutuals, and, and there was a question um, from a lady in the audience about mutuals and co-ops in the previous panel. You know, the Green New Deal can be an option for us to start um, not just building, say, uh, you're shifting the conversation about privatisation versus public ownership. There's also an opportunity for things like um, workers' ownership of the, new group, of, the, of the new green economy, things like that. You know, I'd want to be seeing mining workers owning some of the new projects and things like that under, you know, mutual and co-op sort of options. So the same thing, I think, applies with um, uh, Indigenous land rights as well. This should be an used as an opportunity um, to have a, a conversation to shift the dial on a few different um, points. And just quickly on Ella's point about... Um, uh, cooperation. The first job guarantee motion, or close to, close to Bill Mitchell's model, not quite Bill Mitchell's model, but the first full employment guarantee motion passed by a, um, a major political party was passed last year at the ACT Labor Conference. Uh, a week later, the Tasmanian Greens passed a job guarantee motion, so not showing any sort of partisan favourite um, favouritism here. Um, and the, the one that was passed the week earlier at the ACT Labor Conference was passed because the CPSU and the CFMEU um, work together um, to get it through. Um, so Ella's point about the importance of, of uh, union collaboration and cooperation, you know, those are two unions that don't always... No, few unions see, see eye to eye all the time, um, but the first sort of breakthrough in, in starting to get the job guarantee through traditional party structures was done because of two, two trade unions, and the two trade unions here today, eh? as a matter of fact. Uh, one next question. Oh, sorry, sorry, Paul. We've got to, uh, we've got to wind up. Um, look, thanks everyone. Sorry, we don't have a bit more time. And thanks again for your for forbearance in that earlier interruption. Thanks. 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 Thanks.